When I think of innovation, I think of two of the greatest names. Like um, Joseph Lister, who was actually a professor here at King's, and he said, there is only one rule, put yourself in the patient's place. And the other is, another one of my heroes, Michael Faraday, of the Royal Institution, who said, but still try, for who knows what is possible. And these are really two great aphorisms for both the doctor and the scientist. And it is indeed very exciting um, to work at that interface between science and medicine, and I hope to be able to illustrate that to you in the next few minutes. Um, we know that transplantation is the treatment of choice for children um, in kidney failure, especially from living donors. So this is a kidney donated from mother or father. One of the problems is trying to fit an adult-sized kidney into a very small abdomen. And by very small, I mean less than 15 kilograms. But the other problem is, as you can see, um, children are born with quite complex congenital abnormalities of their blood vessels, which makes it very difficult for us to choose where we're going to actually put the donor kidney onto. So currently, we rely on CT scans and MR scans, um, but they have their limitations. And that, and that therefore means we sometimes have to explore the child first to establish the feasibility of the procedure. This is invasive, but necessary. And clearly, we wanted to work out ways in which we can try and de-risk that process um, and try and avoid it if possible. So I started working almost a year ago now with the Department of Medical Physics um, to look at ways in which we can 3D print the adult donor kidney and the child abdomen as a translational model into operative surgery. And there's our 3D printer there. So our very first case um, was a 10 kilogram child referred from Belfast, born with renal failure and a scarred abdomen. Um, the feasibility was uncertain. We took dad's right kidney um, and we printed um, her entire abdomen, as you can see there. So how do we use this? Well, we actually um, used it for firstly for geometrical correlation. So we can see the model correlated with the segmented designs which correlated with the CT scans and MR scans. And the model then helped us to locate the relevant anastomosis sites on the blood vessels. The liver was printed in a soft material and the pelvis was printed in a very hard material, um, which enabled us to actually maneuver um, some of the anatomy just like we would do. Um, so this is Professor Mahmoud manipulating that kidney um, in, before the child is actually on the operating table, um, a few days before, not just on the day. Um, and, um, and you can see him actually, um, he's trying to work out the best lie of the kidney within that small abdomen, the best approach to the blood vessels, whether we can mobilize the liver up, and critically, the model told us whether we needed to take out the baby's native right kidney in order to create space. And the model told us that perhaps we didn't have to. You can see him pointing to it there. Um, and that's indeed what happened during surgery. Um, we've done many more cases since then, but just to illustrate this one, this is a 12 kilogram child born with a high aortic bifurcation. As you can see, it's completely twisted, um, the common iliac branches. This created quite a divergent opinion amongst the surgical team as to feasibility. We printed the 3D model and 100% um, consensus was made uh, as to the feasibility. And we chose the anastomosis sites on the model which correlated to what we did during the operation. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that 3D printing um, is quite easy to understand and translate clinically. It allows surgery to be simulated before the patient's actually on the operating table. And importantly, it allows a personalized consent process for the family because the models are morphologically specific to them. This was, in fact, the first time this has been um, done. And um, Lucy's story has been viewed over 10 million times worldwide. And her model has been accepted by the Science Museum for permanent exhibition. And I'm pleased to say she's coming over next month to hand that over. Um, for me, personally, when I think of um, innovation, um, this perhaps would never have happened um, for me unless I had a chance, uh, opportunity to go to a lecture on medical physics um, about a year ago. Um, and they were talking about um, 3D printing for hearts. And so I approached them and asked them, could you print me a kidney and an abdomen? And they said, that's beneath us. So, um, <laughs> um, but actually, um, <laughs> um, but, but, but we, found, we had a fantastic collaboration um, in the end. And it's, to take it further, we're actually going to start using 3D printing for complex pediatric liver transplantation, for urology and general surgery. We're also getting referrals now um, from Europe and Asia um, to 3D print complex cases um, for pediatric renal transplant. And I'm hoping to also use the models to improve compliance in medication um, amongst children um, as an educational tool. So, um, perfect introduction, uh, what Sir Bruce said, um, many of the things that uh, he was talking about uh, echo kind of our experiences. I'm first of all going to tell you what SIDAR does uh, and then tell you about the story because uh, this bit kind of makes more sense. Um, what we do is we take um, uh, imaging out of operating rooms, actually imaging from x-ray sets used to guide uh, surgery uh, and we connect it out into the cloud. Um, which is where all of our, our stuff sits. It's, it's uh, software, a cloud high performance computing, uh, and it's a medical device um, and lots of regulation around that. 
the bit that's in the operating room, think of it as a, just a big iPad. It's like a, a panel, piece, panel PC standard equipment. Now, to understand the starting point for the story was I trained all the way through um, in, in open surgery, you know, cuts, stitching things directly, um, only to find out shortly after I became a consultant in the early 2000s that everything had changed with doing keyhole surgery and inside blood vessels we use uh, video x-ray for guidance. And I was frustrated that we couldn't see the anatomy that we wanted to see that we're familiar with seeing. Uh, and this is what we do. Much like the <coughs> camera on your smartphone recognises faces, our software recognises the bones on the live x-ray imaging. From that, deduces where the patient is uh, lying in relation to the x-ray set, and it brings in um, anatomical information and planning information that's otherwise invisible uh, on the, on the x-ray set. So you can see in this example here, this is the aorta and its branches in green, and planning uh, information that's been um, put in by the surgeon before the operation. Uh, 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 integrated with your live guidance all the way through the operation. As the patient moves, x-ray set moves, operating table moves, it just recognises that and updates it. The guy on the right um, is Graham Penny. Um, I went around no literally knocking on doors, first of all here at Guy's and then at Tommy's. Uh, he'd moved offices actually. Um, uh, and uh, 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 yeah, imaging scientist, he'd done work in this area of 2D, 3D image registration. We set up a, a research uh, programme um, our company name comes from what I used to yell across the operating room, can you do another registration, CYDAR. Um, and in 2011, 2012, was real, we realised that we had something here that was a bit special. Uh, and no one else seemed to be able to do this thing of doing this whole process totally hands off, fully automatically. So we set about the process of setting up a company. First thing, you know, stop for a sanity check. Um, is this technology that works? Is there a market for it? Having satisfied ourselves of that, then set about setting up, uh, setting up the company. Probably the best bit of advice I was given, it's, um, it was think of the process as like jumping off a cliff and trying to build an aeroplane on the way down. You can do too much planning in advance. Once you've decided to do it, you need to launch and, and, and commit to it fully. And commit in particular to a commercial path. There was a lot of wariness out there with funders that this is a vehicle for continued uh, research and that you're not trying to try and make a product out of it. Uh, and sometimes not getting you know, some of the grants around um, that are more research uh, uh, focused can help with that. The second thing that we learned very quickly was you need to be professional. You need to hire people different from yourselves. You don't go and hire a lot of postdoc uh, imaging scientists. You need professional programmers. You need a professional CTO. You need a chief financial, uh, chief financial officer. You need external people in on the board so they can give you this commercial kind of savvy around things as to what you need to be doing. You're embarking, healthcare is probably the most difficult sector in the world to be starting a company because it, for very good reasons, it's heavily regulated uh, and you need to be embracing this. A huge amount of resource goes into that, and particularly when you're dealing with uh, medical data and moving it around uh, on the cloud as we do. <coughs> the other thing that I learned um, was that your job becomes a thing which is very uncomfortable as a surgeon, very uncomfortable as, uh, as an academic, which is that you're constantly selling. You're selling your story to investors, you're selling it to the people that you're hiring, good people, uh, not generally sitting around on the street um, you know, waiting for a job. You're luring them from jobs that they're in. So you're selling the vision, you're selling what you're up to. Um, and this goes on all the way through. It goes through as you're getting your first year. We're doing the, the trial. We want you to be involved in the trial and with your first customers as well. So we went through all of that. Um, and we're now out there. We are a commercial company. We are in our first uh, UK sites. We're just doing our US launch at the moment. We're just going to uh, press release going out in the next 24 hours to announce our first uh, go live, our first installation of the US site um, at Duke University Hospital. <coughs> Um, challenges, you're dealing with different people, you're dealing with different cultures and perspectives. Um, it's a really big, really big thing, it's a fantastic thing to be doing, but it's a challenge and it's a very different world. Sorry, actually one other point I will make, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, but one of the things that was going through my mind when we were hearing all this bit about the NHS and also about the university is it is a completely different world when you're a small company. You know, we've doubled in size each year for the last three years. Um, and it, it's very, very difficult interfacing 
for a small company that's moving at that pace with these very big organisations. So I think that's where a lot of the challenges, uh, challenges happen. I'm just going to start a bit about talking about my journey first. And with all good journeys, it comes with a patient story. So I'm going to introduce you to Joe. So Joe is a 60-year-old gentleman who presented to his GP with a bit of weight loss, feeling unwell, and passing urine quite often. At the time, the GP did a blood test, which showed that his sugar was a bit high in the consultation. So reassured Joe, formal blood test. But when Joe returned back to see the GP, he's confirmed the diagnosis of diabetes and cider with some medication. Joe then returned some time later, still feeling unwell, having lost more weight, and medication not really working. The GP at the time affects the medication, changed the drug dosing, and again reassured. Joe. Three months later from the first presentation, Joe collapsed at home. He was brought in by ambulance in an emergency setting to A&E where I first met Joe. He was jaundiced, cachectic, and he had lost significant amounts of weight. I organised an emergency CT scan for Joe which showed he had metastatic pancreatic cancer. Joe died three weeks later. One of the things that struck me when I had met Joe is that at no point did he say, why did I have cancer? In actual fact, what concerned him the most was why was my cancer picked up so late? This resonated with me, because if we had been able to diagnose Joe early, would his story have had a different ending? Looking at cancer within the UK, by 2020, one in two people will have cancer. Of those people, almost 50% will be diagnosed in the late stages. What that means for mortality is that 80% of people diagnosed in late stages will die from their cancer. An early diagnosis has a potential saving 50,000 lives per year. It not only has a life-saving element to it, but also a huge cost saving, as late diagnosis often ends up in A&E and emergency admissions with more complications and more costly treatment. What this means in real terms is that if we are able to diagnose patients early, we would be able to afford 3,000 more doctors, 1,500 more nurses, and 500 more health practitioners, to a total yearly cost savings of £210 million for the NHS. Late diagnosis of cancer was a problem that we set out to solve. Joe's story isn't unique, but this isn't the GP's fault. Any other doctor in that situation would have made the same decision. The challenge actually comes from the ability to be able to influence decision making during the consultation and the opportunity is at its greatest in a time poor setting. Our innovation covers the whole spectrum of cancer. Using artificial intelligence and the latest evidence, we transform the ability of the GP to diagnose cancer early. I'm going to show you a short video of what Joe's story could have ended up with if the GP had this talk in his consultation. As you can see, the GP can directly search the symptom the patient presents with, be signposted to the most appropriate guideline, and enter simple demographic details of the patient in a yes or no fashion. Within 30 seconds, the GP would be able to be told, as it is in this case, to refer the patient for an urgent CT scan for suspected pancreatic cancer. We've been able to gain widespread support from Macmillan Cancer Research UK and endorsement from the East of England Cancer Clinical Network, as well as partnering with two clinical commissioning groups and the chair of the guideline development group. We plan to launch the application in May with a body of research around it to actually demonstrate the impact it has on stage of diagnosis and then wider dissemination of the tool within the NHS. Our next step really is to be able to bring the power of diagnostics directly into the patient's hands, to be able to give patients the ability to screen their own symptoms in a personalised fashion, taking into account their demographics, their family history and their personal details. I'm here now to briefly talk about my entrepreneurial journey with Health Make Space. Uh, which started around the time when I first set up um, the Medical Students Association here at GKT uh, to where I am now as um, Sir Bruce's youngest appointment as a National Clinical Entrepreneur Fellow. Now, according to Ipsos Mori, one of the top concerns for their electorate in the last general election 
was healthcare. Now, after Brexit, you can take opinion polls with a pinch of salt, but there's no denying that healthcare is, and the NHS in particular, is faced with a specific funding crisis. Now, why is that? The, one of the key reasons what we have to look at is that we have a growing population with uh, increasingly complex multimorbidities and the increasing costs of paying for that care. So while I was doing my master's in public health, I scratched my head and many others to try and find out a solution as to how we can improve efficiency across the NHS, given that the current government are reluctant to spend any more funding on the NHS. And what emerged is data and digital as being key to improving efficiency, saving lives, most importantly, and as well as saving money. So right now, with data and digital, the problem isn't that we don't have enough health technology. Rather, it's that we have too many. And the problem with this is that many, we have over 150,000 healthcare apps at the moment, but disproportionately few are, are used in everyday clinical practice. We've also got digitizing of processes where you can look for, at the med medical record saga which cost over 10 billion pounds and was eventually scrapped. Now one of the key reasons underpinning these failures is the lack of clinician involvement in the process from conception to execution. And this is where Health Make Space comes in. Health Make Space is a unique digital platform that brings healthcare <coughs> startups together with clinicians matched by their mutual time, availability and expertise to co-create better health technology. Now, as a medic and now as a doctor, my whole career progression centres around peer review publications, but there's no similar currency for innovation. So I'm very excited to announce that with NHS England and our partners, we've been working on developing the first national clinical innovation points accreditation scheme so that clinicians are rewarded and recognised for their innovative and entrepreneurial efforts within their hospital trusts. Now, the digital challenge is not unique to England, rather it's a universal one. And with the, with the current healthcare in the financial crisis, this is something that's common to everyone. So our broader vision for Health Make Space is for it to become the first port of call for healthcare startups across the world, across the world where they can find clinicians to develop, to develop, test and scale up their products based on evidence and usability. So being a clinician and as well as an entrepreneur can be a very lonely process. But being part of Health Make Space you're part of a greater community where you can find like-minded individuals and gain exposure to some of the cutting-edge projects that you've heard from some of our entrepreneurs today. And at the same time, ensuring that you're recognised for your efforts. So if you have any other questions and you want to join us, then you can find us outside as well. I am a King's alumni. I did my uh, BSc in Women's Health um, here at um, King's in 2013. And I'm now... Um, an F2 at St George's, um, but I've been carrying on my research with the women's health team at King's since then. So I wanted to talk to you about Quip, which is an app um, which I developed as part of my BSc project to predict preterm birth. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about that. So um, basically, a bit of background. So preterm birth is a huge problem um, and I, learned, I sort of started to learn about that at, during my BSc. So 15 million babies each year are preterm and one million of them die. And obviously this is emotionally devastating but also has huge economic repercussions. Um, and the costs of preterm birth are actually on a par with um, obesity and alcohol related problems. So part of my BSc project was to work um, with two tests um, and analyse their effectiveness and then combine them and put them into an algorithm to predict preterm birth better so that we can see what's coming and help to then prevent it or mediate the effects at least. So I suppose what got me really interested actually is, is not the kind of academic, academic facts about preterm birth but the reality 
of seeing women in a preterm surveillance clinic, which I attended during the year at St. Um, at St. Thomas's. Uh, with the women's health team, where you saw women who had been affected by sometimes up to five um, late miscarriages, um, really at their wit's end and thought they'd never be able to have a baby. Um, and I think that kind of is what really motivated me to try and help do something about it. That's sort of where it started. And as I said, the aim of the project, the initial BSC project, was to develop a model to predict spontaneous preterm birth using these two tests, one of which is a swab, so if I just go back, a fetal fibronectin swab, which is a vaginal swab that's taken from pregnant women, and the other one is a measurement of her cervical length, and these measurements are done um, periodically throughout her pregnancy. And the idea of the app is um, that we made from the algorithm um, that I developed is that you put these two readings from each woman into an algorithm and it turns out a percentage risk of her giving birth prematurely. And that means that you can then act on them because there are interventions that can be effective and can help to prevent preterm birth. Um, so the app itself is a, it's a very simple interface. It's available on the app store. Um, and um, you put in, as I said, the, the fetal fibronectin result and the <coughs> cervical length for each woman, and it turns out a risk of her giving birth at clinically important preterm gestations um, at a time where it can be useful to, for us to do something about it. So it's available as an iPhone app and also um, on iPad um, and desktop. Um, and I suppose um, I was asked to say a bit about how it's having an effect. Um, and um, there's a special program that you can use when you um, make something available in the App Store and it shows you where it's been downloaded. So this app is now being used and downloaded all over the world. Um, it's really great. I get emails from people all over the world asking questions about it and suggesting improvements and um, it's just very exciting because some of these people are kind of esteemed health professionals and obstetricians and having that exchange kind of feeding back into improving the app is, is very exciting. So where are we going with the app? Um, the exciting thing is, is that it's now being used um, in the clinic at St. Thomas's, um, and I've seen um, women um, who are very happy about that, and they're reassured by the fact that we can tailor management to them specifically, which hasn't before been possible. Um, and it's great to see, um, and uh, from ca continuing to work in this clinical environment and see the sort of application of the research means that we can continuously feed new ideas in. So now we're making it um, useful for women who have multiple pregnancies and who are not only um, just at risk of preterm birth, but who are symptomatic of preterm birth. So it's this constant evolution, which is very exciting and I feel very privileged to be a part of. And I would really urge anyone... Um, who is interested in research, you know, whatever stage you are, just get involved because it's very exciting and you can really feel that you're making some kind of sustainable difference. Can I just make sure that you do engage with the King's Entrepreneurship Institute? It's a fantastic innovation itself um, and it provides all kinds of support for you developing your own entrepreneurial skills. Uh, runs courses and runs events uh, and then you've heard reference to the King's 20 Accelerator Scheme which is there to support uh, ideas to see them through uh, to development. So um, please engage with that.